All right, so for something a bit different, uh, so these uh, handouts are just now on uh, the web page. Um, so, <coughs> so far we've been looking a lot about pictures and um, you could believe that's because I'm biased towards working on uh, computer vision applications and it's probably true, but as well it's because um, really the deep learning uh, revolution started with uh, image processing and image applications, okay? Um, so now we're going to look at another aspect of, um, of the, you know, another application of deep learning, which is uh, text processing. And that's something that really started to uh, be uh, used massively uh, in the last, I don't know, three years or so, okay? So all the machine translation systems uh, have been changed uh, recently and you probably witnessed that massive improvement on uh, speech to text uh, um, processing or um, <coughs> so if you look on YouTube and the um, <coughs> auto caption system it's pretty good okay it's actually making progress uh, all the time and this is really down to the the use of deep learning in text processing okay so <coughs> in this handout we're going to look at um, the, the basic idea of how we can use text and process text with numbers, okay? So the problem we had so far was that we've done, okay, when we work with pixels, well, they're the discretized versions, but they it still corresponds to something that is continuous, okay? So the intensity of the light that hits uh, um, uh, a pixel, um, that is a continuous nature, okay? Um, and same, if you work on speech processing, you're working with uh, audio signal, and audio signal is continuous in nature as well, okay? So all that is fine, and, and it means you can work with you know, vectors of numbers and do linear algebra and so on, and, and that makes sense, okay? Of course, with text processing, the issue you have is, um, sorry, text, you know, is not um, made of continuous entities, made of words and symbols, okay? So it's very uh, discrete uh, entities and um, you, know, you don't have vectors of real numbers coming from, from words, all right? But this is what we're going to look at, okay? Because to work in neural nets, we need to somehow represent the words or letters using vectors, okay? And that seems like a mad idea, and it is, um, but it's something we need to do because the framework we have uh, text as an input vectors. Um, this process is called uh, encoding or embedding, okay? So here we talk about character encoding or, or um, character embedding or word encoding or word embedding. So the idea is we're going to encode, say, a word into a vector, okay? So that's the idea. All right, so the simplest type of encoding you can think of is the one hot encoding and something you've probably seen before. So the idea is that you have a dictionary of symbols, okay? So if you look here at um, um, a dictionary, um, so we have a very small dictionary in this example. So we have uh, a cat is sitting, okay? So a cat is sitting. So you have four words here and they're, uh, for what we know, they could be spelled differently. It doesn't matter how they're spelled. It's just, we know we have four words. And so we have a dictionary of four entries, with four entries. And so we can define a word hand, hard encoding by having a vector of zeros and ones, okay? So basically the, the it's a, um, so you have the, the vector as, as many entries as you have in your, in your dictionary. And then you say, put zero everywhere and you put one where the, um, for, the, for the word you want to express, okay? So in this example, the word for cat, so the word encoding for cat, so I call that x cat, is this vector, which is 0, 1, 0, 0, okay? All right, so just it's an index, just index um, uh, in your dictionary. All right, so nothing fancy here is something you've done uh, a lot of time, and, and this works well, um, especially if you're working with characters, okay? So if you have the 27 letters of the alphabet, uh, you can encode them in the following way, okay? So you have this um, 
um, a vector space of dimension 26, and then you put all these letters here. Okay. Now this is, um, I'm not going to spend too much time because this is you know, obvious representation. Um, this is a very good representation for uh, characters. Okay. So in fact, people, um, a lot of people doing text processing will use one hot encoding on characters. Okay. And that just works fine. The problem is if you start working with words, okay? So there is about, uh, give or take 200,000 words in the English dictionary, okay? Um, these words have many expressions. So, you know, if you have uh, to have, then you have having, had, has, and so on, okay? So you have different representation. Um, and so in total, the number of tokens, so the number of um, words, you know, a series of letters that are different uh, it's about in the order of a few millions, okay? So, you know, say 13 millions, okay? So, uh, that's quite a lot, okay? So now if you have to start to, you want to encode words with a one hot encoding scheme, you have a bit of a problem because now your word, your input vectors are from dimension 13 million, okay? I think you need to use something else in Python to do that, okay? Because if you start to open up a vector of dimension 13 million, uh, NumPy might start to complain. Right, so this just doesn't cut it, okay? So this is one of the problems. The other problem as well, so the size, definitely a problem. The other problem, of course, is this is what we want to do, okay? So when we're doing um, machine learning, we're working in an Euclidean vector space, okay? But that means that we can take the input vectors, we're going to do um, additions, we're going to look at the inner product and so on and so forth, okay? So these are actually the three main points. We need to have a vector. We need to be able to do some kind of linear uh, combination of these vectors. And then we need to be able to do a scalar product. With one hot encoding, that doesn't make sense, okay? So that means that, you know, if you take my word representation for, for these, uh, so two times x cat plus 3.2 times x sitting plus minus uh, 1.5 times um, the, the, the one hot encoding for is, then you get a vector which is 0, 2, minus 1.5, 3.2. That's great, but this is not a word anymore, okay? So you, you, you somehow map your words into this vector space, but when, as, as soon as you start doing some kind of very basic addition uh, of, your, of your words, then you see you end up with uh, vectors that don't make sense anymore back in your original space, which was the space of all the words you have, okay? So this is a bit of a problem, okay? So how can you make somehow linear algebra with these words, okay? Um, and in a way that still somehow makes as much sense as possible. So this is problem number one. Second problem with one hot encoding is, as I said, we need to define the scalar product, okay? Which is something we use all the time. This is when, when you use neural net, the first thing you do is a scalar product between your inputs and some weights, right? So you need to, this needs to correspond to something. And the problem is with one hot encoding, um, because you have zeros everywhere and only one at a particular entry, when you have two words and you do the scalar product between these two words, then you have necessarily zero as an output, okay? So this doesn't really help, okay? So whatever the words I have, I do the scalar product between these two words and I end up with zero, okay? So this is a bit of a problem because usually scalar product is associated with um, a notion of similarity, okay? So you kind of project one, word, no, the idea would be you project one vector onto the other vector and you're trying to see how close these two vectors are, really, that's what's going on, okay? So if you have a very large scalar product, uh, probably means that the two vectors are very similar in some ways, okay? A note, uh, side note, in, in, uh, when we compare words, usually uh, what people use is, um, um, the, the similarity they use is actually the cosine similarity, and um, it's just this quantity here, so it's a scalar product divided by the norms of the two vectors, okay? So really what you're looking here at the angle that separates the two vectors in that, that space. Okay, so this is usually the metric you use. And so if you have a cosine similarity of plus one, that means that the two vectors are identical. 
So the two words are, should be identical. And if you have a similarity of minus one, then that means the, the vectors are very dissimilar or the words should be very dissimilar. Okay, so it's a number between minus one and one. Okay, so with one hot encoding, we're only really solving the problem one, which is to define these vectors. And we're not solving at all any of these two points, which is like we should be able to add them and do linear combination of those. And we should be able to have some kind of, um, we need to define the, um, the, 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 the inner products on these words. All right. So <coughs> comes this, um, this word encoding uh, techniques. Okay. So I'm trying to hear um, a very high level view on what's going on. Okay. Um, and basically I'm trying to merge three different techniques um, that uh, you will find um, in the literature. So the, the first two, uh, well, the, the most famous one is probably word to vec okay? So word to vec is um, the attempt at doing this word encoding using neural nets. And it was devised in 2013 by a team at Google. And so we're going to look a bit at what's going on uh, using uh, that technique. Um, but as it turns out, this is very, actually very close, very similar mathematically to two other techniques actually that are not uh, neural net based, okay? So you have one technique which should be using the um, matrix factorization technique, uh, so using the SVD decomposition. And then another paper called GLOVE uh, 2014, um, which um, again, is not a neural net based technique, okay? So I'm going to see how this technique try to solve the problem. Uh, so I put links here uh, for you to look at. Um, well, the, the link to these two papers here is probably a bit um, you know, hard to follow. The word to vec is okay, it's just neural net stuff, so you probably could follow it. Um, this is a blog post only uh, on this SVD. It's quite, actually quite a nice blog post, so if you want to read that, that's, that's okay. Right, so this is what we're going to do, okay? So the, most of the techniques the need to express somehow, okay, if you come back here, they need to express uh, not just words, but words, words in relation to other words, okay? So we have, you know, what's the relationship between the word cat and the word sitting, okay? It's kind of how we can to, to look at, trying to define these things. We're trying to see how words compare to each other. So to do that, what we're going to do is to, um, look at something called the co-occurrence statistics, okay? Um, so this notion of co-occurrence is basically um, relates to how close the words are to each other, okay? So if you look at a sentence, so a cat is sitting on a suitcase, you can, you know, if you're looking at the word sitting, so this is the kind of target word you're looking at, you can define a context window. So the context window is just um, a notion of neighborhood, okay? So when you looked at convolutional neural nets, you defined a notion of neighborhood by this convolution mask. You say, you know, looking at pixels three by three. Um, here's the same idea. You can say, I'm going to look at the, uh, uh, you know, five words uh, uh, context window, which means I'll be looking at the words plus or minus two words, okay? So my target is sitting, and my context window is the four neighboring words around that uh, word sitting. So in this case, it's be cat is on a, okay? And the order in which they are doesn't really matter at this point. And what we're interested in is, if you want, is how often do you have, you know, if you look at the word sitting, what is interesting is to see how frequently it is to have the other words in that context. So, if you see that cats, so here we see that cat is close to sitting, okay? So we found in, in the whole corpus of text we have, we're going to be counting how many times cat is close to sitting, okay? So we look at the two words and trying to count the number of times these two words come close to each other, okay, within that context window. And this will define for us the core occurrence frequency, okay? So core occurrence means that the two words co-occur, so occur at the same time. So, you know, the both words actually um, are close to each other at some point in, 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 uh, in time. Okay, so we're going to build these statistics. And why this is interesting, okay? Um, 
So this is a, a very small corpus of, word, of sentences. So, uh, so the first three is that a cat is sitting on a couch, a person is sitting on a chair, and we are all sitting on a sofa. What is interesting is you look at the last word, okay? And you look at the context of the last words. The context of the last words are the same. So couch, chair, and sofa all have the same, exactly the same context, all right? So it's kind of interesting, you know? It's kind of like same context probably means that the function of that word is kind of similar in some ways, okay? The same here, say Paris is the capital of France, Rome is the capital of Italy, Dublin is the capital of Ireland. You can see that, you know, all the capitals, Paris, Rome, Dublin, somehow have very similar context in this corpus, okay? Now, of course, if you start looking at huge corpus, you have different views, and, you know, that wouldn't be, like, as clear as that. But the idea is, like, if two words have very similar uh, core current statistics, okay, if you look at the frequencies of the, the, the neighborhoods, if you find that you, the frequencies kind of seem to match for one word to another, probably mean that the, the two words could be used in the same, well, context, right? So they, the two words could be interchanged somehow, okay? So <coughs> that is interesting, okay? So it's very, um, here we're, we're just looking, it's kind of, um, um, if you want, um, um, unsupervised learning. We're just looking at the corpus and we're just looking at the statistics and how the words occur in pair. And we say, well, just looking at that corpus, we can see that couch, chair, and sofa probably are similar. Paris, Rome, and Dublin probably the same. And same for verbs like you know, want and wish as well. Okay? So it doesn't really matter if it's a noun or verb or anything like that. The, just looking at the statistics of the, of the context helps you to um, to understand what that word does, okay? So that's kind of the key that all these embedding systems are going to work on, okay? The realization that the co-occurrences between words is really a key to how similar the words are. So, all right, here's where the maths are, and fortunately, um, I can't use the, the um, the, the, the camera, the document camera here, because it uh, doesn't work in this room. So just we're going to go as, as slowly as possible, okay? So this is what we're going to do, okay? We're going to define all what we talked about. So first we have um, the dictionary, okay? So we have dictionary, and I didn't say that, but I would say it's of size n, okay? And then we're going to define a word for that. So XI means that this is the word embedding for a particular entry indexed I. All right? This is something we have to define. We don't know that if we don't we don't have a sense for that yet. So we're going to define the probability of co-occurrence as P indexed IJ. And so that means that um, both XI and XJ co occur with a frequency of P IJ. Okay, so I build this massive matrix. I looked at all my corpuses. I looked at all the pairs of words I can find, and I compute this, um, all these probabilities. In fact, what you have is a table. Okay, it's a matrix, you know, uh, a two D matrix, and it's very sparse matrix because you have lots of words that never appear close to another words. Okay, so I don't know if you use um, the word Mandelbrot, for instance, okay, for fractals it's unlikely that it will be close to, say, relationship, okay? So these two words, probably in your corpus, will never appear together, so probably you have a zero as an entry, okay? So just keep in mind that this is mostly zeros everywhere, and then a few uh, odd, um, well, actually quite a number of times you have uh, ones, but this is, um, this is what you have. So let's keep the math notations. Um, uh, just keep in mind that there are huge issues with the size we're dealing with, okay? So the number of words you have is, you know, in the order of hundreds of thousands, and now we have a matrix of hundreds of thousands by hundreds of thousands, which is really not practical. So just deal with that is, is, is an issue here, okay? But right now, just forget about that and just focus on the maths. So we have this probability, okay, um, that tells us about the core currents of the two words. And now here's the, the kind of, the, the 
the non-intuitive idea, I suppose, is that not only we're going to represent words as uh, vectors, but we're going to represent the context as a vector as well. Okay, a vector of the same size. And just, I'll show you an example after that, um, but um, <coughs> just trust me at this point, okay? So we're going to have a vector for defining the world and a vector for defining the context. And I usually use, uh, you use a tilde notation on top of that, okay? So this x tilde j represent the context of the word j. Okay, so I've analyzed th this, this vector embodies, if you want, all the information we have about the statistics of the context of that particular word. Okay, so coming back on this one, if you're looking at the word uh, Paris, um, there will be a lot of different context around Paris, and we can look at all the probabilities, statistics you have between the probability that a word is close to Paris. Okay, so we have a lot of these numbers, and uh, all that information will be somehow uh, embedded in that vector uh, tilde. And the way we're going to combine all these three things we have is very simple. We're going to say that the scalar products between a word and the context would be just a probability. All right, so this is kind of the key formula, um, uh, or the key formula we'll be using here. The, all right, so I'll show you a concrete example here, okay? So it seems crazy, but if you <coughs> stick to the one hot encoding, it's not that mad, okay? So if we use a one hot encoding for the words, this is what we'll have on the left. So we have xi is your vector with plenty of zeros and just a one at some point. If you choose for the context vector, just the probability if you collect all the probabilities, so if you say what the probability that one vector, uh, that word one is close to J and so on, that word P, uh, the word N is close to J. So you collect all the probabilities or all the frequencies, if you want, for a word to belong to that context, okay? So you can see you have two vectors. They're of the same dimension. So this is of size N, this is the size of your dictionary. This is same because you're looking through every single word in your dictionary and trying to look at the probability that this word is close to, to J, okay? And you have your two words and you see if you do the scalar product between the two, then it would be, you know, zeros everywhere except for the entry uh, I and J here. So you have the scalar product between the two is actually just a probability, okay? This is not what people do, but it's just to give you um, uh, an idea how, you know, the, the separation between the, the context representation and the, 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 the word representation. So as a helper, you think of word representation as a one hot encoding and the, ex, the, the, the context representation as the representation of all the probabilities of coherences. Are you lost here? Does this kind of make sense? All right. So, <coughs> so this is what we have, okay? The, the other way of looking at that is to say, you know, what does it mean here, okay? So you have a word on the left and you're doing the scalar product with a context. So you're thinking, you're thinking in terms of uh, um, theta theory, it's kind of like saying, you know, the scalar, project, uh, the scalar product is kind of the projection, if you want, of this word onto the context or the intersection, if you want. So you look at the context of this word, J, and you look at the intersection with, you know, it, does this word belong into the context of that? And if it does, then you just you return the frequency on that. Okay, it's kind of the idea, like the, the scalar product is kind of your, your uh, projection or your intersection, if you want, okay? So how similar is this word belongs, no, how, how is it likely that this word belongs into the context? Okay, so this is a key, okay? So now somehow we have a target. So we still don't know what this rep representation are. I mean, we've, we have a hot, one hot encoding, but we know it's not good. But we have some kind of formula that links exactly what we want. So what we're looking at it was especially this scalar product. And you know, how do you link scalar products and the word vector? And now we have a formula for that. And we link that to this idea of core occurrences. So that's kind of the key here. Um, so 
The problem, of course, is this is huge, okay? So we can't really deal with this kind of water presentation. Uh, so here come the maths parts, okay? Actually, it's not that hard, okay? Is what we need to do is to reduce that words to a dimension lower than n. So we have that from a dictionary of size n, and now we're going to reduce that to uh, uh, a lower rank, if you want, it's called r, okay? So the, the number of entries now in your vectors can be smaller. Right? And, <coughs> and effectively, what we'll be doing is uh, it's called row rank matrix factorization. And it goes as follows. So um, the, if you stack all the word vectors into a matrix, and this is what you get, OK? So you put all the word you have, OK? And if you put all the context vectors into a matrix, you have W tilde here, which is concatenation of all you guys, okay? And now what you say is that the matrix of all my co-occurrences, okay? Or the property, the co-occurrences property, sorry. So P is equal to this uh, product of the words and the word matrix and the words context matrix, okay? This is just, we formally, it's just the extension of that, okay? So we have that in a vectorial form this is true for every single pair of vector. Now, if you stack all the vectors, a bit like we've done for the design matrix for least square, it's the same here. We have the same matrix formulation, which end up with this equation here, okay? So W is a matrix that will stack all the word vector representation, and W tilde would be a word, uh, a context matrix representing all the, um, the context uh, representation. Both matrices are of size n by r. So n is the um, n is the size of your dictionary, and r is a new size you want. Okay. So say you're working with English, you have two n would be two hundred thousand, and r typically would be maybe two hundred. Okay. So you want to represent a, a word with only a vector of size two hundred, for instance. Okay. So you say I want somehow to reduce are to have something much smaller than n, right? So you're to, you say, okay, somehow I need to be able to express, to factorize this matrix P into this product of these two matrices, but these two matrices are much smaller than P in size, okay? Because yes, they start with size n, but then uh, you have still n uh, rows, but you only have R columns, okay? Is it okay? Probably not, okay, that's fine. We'll move on. Um, so one way of doing that is loads of ways. If you look at different papers, they will talk about different optimization techniques. One you use actually gradient descent to, to find that. Uh, so Glove, uh, one of the papers, actually uh, does that, does uh, just a gradient descent. There's a technique that is uh, really, really available for you um, with NumPy is SVD. Okay, so SVD, so who is familiar with SVD here? Have you done SVD? I'm surprised. Um, all right, so it's, uh, it's a very, it's one of the, the pillars of linear algebra, okay? So it's one of the, the techniques you really should be reading about, and um, th this is super useful, okay? So this is called a singular value um, decomposition, and it basically it factorizes the matrix P by a product of uh, U sigma, and V, and so U and V are orthogonal matrices, and sigma is a diagonal matrix that will contain all the eigenvalues for your matrix, okay? So this is a very, um, <clears throat> all right, this is, this is super standard technique, okay, and that's used all the time. If you're doing a least square to find the, um, to, 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 to solve for the normal equations, you know, you have a matrix to invert. Usually people don't invert the matrix explicitly. They use this kind of technique to, um, or, or, or derived techniques to do the inversion, okay? So this is um, a well-known technique, and so basically a NumPy, you just, this is one, a one-liner, you say, or oh, give me the SVD decomposition of this matrix, and I will give you back um, uh, these three matrices for you, okay? <coughs> the way you find W and W tilde is usually you assign, um, u sigma to w 
and you said that uh, w tilde is v. Okay. The the matrices you have as they come from SVD, there will be uh, square matrices. So u will be the same size as p, and v will be the same size as p. Um, that's okay uh, because usually what happens is like you get back um, this matrix as well, so sigma, and the, the, the values of sigma uh, will range from you know, very high to very low. Okay, so usually they rank them from the high values to the low values, and usually what people do is they will uh, say that the, they will only keep the highest values, okay? So if you want to have your um, approximation, the best approximation of this matrix um, with uh, a lower rank, so by removing some of these elements, what you do is you keep the first sigmas and set all the other sigmas to zero, okay? So it's a usual trick. You take the lower eigenvalues and you set them to zero, and the effect it has is basically you can discard in your matrix all the other um, uh, columns. Okay, so your matrix W was a square matrix n by n, but now you can say if you are only interested in a rank R approximation, what I do is I only keep the first uh, R columns. Okay, so you just take your first R columns in your matrix and you're good to go. All right. This is something you probably should look into. This is uh, something. It's one of these um, <coughs> techniques that um, show up everywhere, okay? Not only here, they show up in all fields of engineering or, or, or computer science at some point or another, okay? So this is one of the pillars of linear algebra. Um, and it's a very classic technique, so it's called um, <coughs> rank approximation um, of, of, a, of a matrix. And the optimal technique for that is actually SVD. That's the best way of, 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 um, of doing it. The point here is, okay, so, so my point here is like, it all starts from here, okay? So this definition of a word vector and a context vector, okay? So think of the context vector if you want at your probabilities, okay? This defines, you say, well, this similarity, um, this inner product defines the probability of co-occurrence. From that, then after it's just linear algebra. The problem is you stack all these guys, you realize, okay, now I have this matrix approximation problem, so I need to factorize this particular matrix into these two other matrices of smaller size, smaller rank. There's a bunch of techniques for that. One of them is SVD, okay? So you use SVD, that will get you the matrix for factorization for you, all right? And now you get a word representation which is only doesn't use the entirety of the alphabet. So, you know, you have only a few, uh, you, you, each, each of your word representation is just uh, a row here. So to represent word one, you just take these R values here you have. So U11, one, one, U12, one, U13, one, U1R. One okay, this would be the presentation for, uh, so this one, this vector here would be the vector corresponding to one, okay, to the word one. All right? So, Key ingredient here, build the metrics of co occurrences, okay, get priorities from that, so you get this metrics. You apply SVD and you use, um, you take only the first uh, whatever number of eigenvalues you want, and then you get back these uh, matrices magically with the word uh, embeddings. A note here, okay, so. Uh, <clears throat> There's different ways of looking at that. So um, people realize that sometimes trying to match exactly the probability is not the best idea. So people looked at different ways. So something to know is like the, we can use the uh, positive points. <coughs> <coughs> the positive point wise mutual information um, at the model, or you can use just a log as well, or, or other vari variations on that, okay? So the, the idea is like you're still uh, trying to match something derived from the core currencies Maybe not exactly the probability of core occurrence, but something that is based on this. So let's look at some results here, okay? So this is using GLOVE, okay? So GLOVE trying to factorize your matrices using that model here, so the log of the probabilities. And so you get back some world vector representation, and I forgot what the size is, like they give different size. I think one of them is like 600, um, uh, a vector of, you know, each word is represented as a vector of 600 values or 
200 or whatever number of uh, 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 vector size you want. So, all right, this is what it looks like. So, first thing, you know, showing some ex examples, so this is taken from their web page. Um, so, if you look at the word um, vector for frog, and you look now in that, um, in that space for what the nearest neighbors, the word, you know, in the, so you have a point cloud of all your, of all your, your word vectors, and you're looking now at which, is, which are the nearest neighbor to that, uh, to that word frog. And this is the uh, nearest neighbor you get, okay? So, um, so you can see Toad and Litoria and so on, okay? What is amazing here is I like, just showed the picture to help you, you know, visualize that, but there's no CNN or anything like that. It's just based on context co-occurrences, okay? So just blind analysis on the statistics of co-occurrences of two words. We can see pattern emerging, and basically what we find here is that the pattern the, the context around, um, say, Rana is very similar to the context around frog, okay? And so therefore, these two words are somehow connected and very close to each other, all right? So it's quite amazing, all right? So it's quite interesting. Another example, um, I will come back to the idea of doing linear algebra, okay? Which is something I didn't really talk, no, mostly talk about scalar products. Um, these are, there's all this kind of um, um, <clears throat> interesting, what they call that linear substructures, but this is a, a projection of, um, on a 2D plane of some of these uh, words, okay? And, and you can see that, um, so what you see the points here, so this is uh, the coordinates, if you want, for the uh, word for woman, and this is the coordinate for the word for man, okay? And they can see there's some kind of relationship between some words. So you can see that if you look at the vector to go from man to woman, okay, it's kind of the same as you have to go from king to queen, right? It's kind of an interesting um, linear algebra um, uh, properties being discovered by the system. So really what it means, like if you do, if you do x, the, if you do the word for man minus the word for woman, then it's approximately the same as the word, you know, as the word for sir minus the, the word for woman, and so on. Okay, so you start to discover this kind of intriguing properties in, in, from the language. All right, and this is just coming from the SVD factorization of your matrix, okay? Similarly, here, so another example of that. So again, we're looking at projection of these word vectors onto a 2D plane here. Uh, we can see relationship between comparative and superlative. So strong is, you know, the relationship between strong and stronger is the same as between clear and clear, okay? So you have this idea that, okay, you can do somehow, there is some idea of um, you can add vectors and subtract them and get some kind of information, okay? It doesn't work for everything, okay? Um, but you still have to some extent, trying to replicate as much of that as you can, okay? Trying to be able to say you add vectors and you still have a concept emerging from the addition of the sub subtraction on this, on this, on these words. Um, I use this one as well because I think it's funky, just to make you realize that numbers, okay, digits, uh, if they're in a corpus, there will be, you know, tokens in your, in your dictionary. And um, this shows the relationship between zip code in the, um, of US towns and their names. And you can see that it's kind of a nice relationship between the actual zip code uh, it relates to the, to the name of the town. Which makes sense again, because you know, these are just symbols, it doesn't matter um, how they're expressed, okay? <coughs> All right, so I'm going to stop here because I think this is um, enough. I won't have time to um, explain what to make. Um, this is something, um, if you're working with word embeddings, you're working with text, you know, to know about this is important, okay? So you don't have to know in detail how this technique works because usually you will end up just using these embeddings, okay? So you will be in Kara, so you'll be like, I'm using Glove model and here's the, you know, it's a timetable. It's probably not a timetable, it's a lookup table. So for every single word entry, you get back this vector of 
words. You know, you get a vector, okay? And this is pre-computed for you, so you just have to read this, this lookup table and say, I have this word, I replace this word with this vector, okay? But the point is, it helps you discover things about the language, and now you can start doing a bit better linear algebra. You can start to put that into neural net thinking, okay, it will do stuff, it will use scalar products and so on, but at least can I have some hope that it will make some sense, okay, and not just some black magic, okay? All right, thank you.